Good morning, everyone, and I'd like to welcome you all to our next aquaculture webinar series presented by the United States Aquaculture Society, the National Aquaculture Society, and the Alabama Cooperative Extension System. I'm David Klein, and today we're fortunate to have with us Dr. David Love. Thank you, uh, Dave and Alan, for inviting me. Um, it's just a pleasure to, to make some time today to speak with you guys. Um, about seafood in the diet, consumption patterns at retail and food service. Um, and this is an area that's really, I think, been understudied. And hopefully today I'll shed some light on a couple of key questions. Okay, so uh, I'm really fortunate to have a wonderful um, cast of collaborators who've helped um, on many of these projects I'll be talking about today. Um, both folks at Johns Hopkins, University of Florida, William and Mary, um, UMass Boston, and then a whole team from around the world on the work on COVID and seafood. Uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, several different topics. Uh, of course, the, the 800 pound gorilla in the room is COVID impacts on seafood. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, impacts on seafood consumption in the US, uh, followed by some pre-COVID data <laughs> on what we know about US seafood consumers and how much they eat, um, the retail, and food service sectors. And then I'll end with just a summary slide with some thoughts. Um, so um, most of this talk today is gonna focus on the US uh, seafood supply, but there'll, there'll be lessons that you can draw from that can be applied to other countries as well. Um, so um, really, okay, so this COVID and seafood is a, is a really big topic and it uh, includes a lot of things, but um, I'm just gonna focus on seafood consumption uh, during COVID. Um, back in the spring, I teamed up with 17 other seafood experts from around the world to write a paper about COVID impacts on the seafood sector, uh, responses and lessons learned for the future. Um, our paper is in peer review right now, and there's a link at the bottom of the screen um, where you can find the preprint. Um, but specifically for consum the consumption angle, and uh, this graphic uh, represents uh, um, kind of a model of the, of the seafood um, supply chain where you can see production, processing, distribution, markets, and consumers. And COVID-19 has impacted all stages of these, of this supply chain. Um, and it's done it in a lot of different ways. Um, one thing to look at is the middle of this uh, circle in blue. Uh, these are the things that, that we really care about. Um, well-being, um, livelihoods, and, and food security. And if we think about COVID impacts on consumers and markets, um, and you'll see uh, this sort of flower petal uh, radiating out from the blue. Um, this is a, a sort of hypothesized gradient of impacts we see on consumers. Um, it, they're likely to be more impacts um, facing low-income low income consumers than high-income consumers. Um, COVID impacts to markets we see more impacts at the um, food service sector than the food retail sector. So this, this schematic just sort of gives you an idea about general, general impacts. But uh, there are some more data sets that we can turn to to understand this. Um, the USDA Economic Research Service puts out a monthly food expenditure series. Um, and they, um, this is looking at, this graph shows you um, the change in year over year food sales for food at home and food away from home. Let me define those two terms just so you have a sense. Uh, food at home is, um, is food that's purchased um, primarily at retail and eaten at home. And food away from home is food that you eat outside of the home, typically restaurants, but also uh, if you eat at, um, at a school or, or at a company or other institutions. So food at home is retail, and food away from home is, is restaurant and food service. And um, due to uh, state shutdowns and social distancing measures, you can see there's been a really dramatic drop off in restaurant expenditures in March. Um, and that's compared to 20, uh, March of 2019. And uh, the retail sector got a bump initially, um, as you know, from panic buying, but also households um, have shifted more towards purchasing their food at retail. So this is USDA data, and this is for the whole food system um, in the US. But let's look a little bit more specifically at seafood. So this is a, um, 
uh, from a paper put together by Easton White and colleagues about seafood um, COVID-19 impacts to U.S. seafood. Um, this figure shows Google search results for uh, three uh, seafood related terms. And just to orient you to the, the, the figure, um, the red dashed line in each of these three figures is, represents March 11th, which is the date that the WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. Um, you'll see in each of these figures, the blue the, the or teal color is uh, search terms in 2020. And then the gray are search terms in, in past years. Um, so you wanna look at the difference between the blue compared to the gray. And um, so the left uh, figure sh uh, shows search terms where people were Googling the term uh, seafood restaurant. And you can see, you know, post pandemic, there's been a big drop in people looking for seafood restaurants. Uh, but the middle slide shows that there's a, been an uptick in people looking for seafood delivery options. Um, that could be grocery store deliveries or restaurant deliveries. And then also there's been a, a, an uptick in people wanting to know more about how to cook seafood recipes. Um, so these are just search terms and they just, they give you a little bit of a feel for the way consumers are thinking about seafood. But let's look at some, some more data. So um, this, this data comes from Nielsen, which um, if you ever uh, look, look them up, they have a wonderful website that's been tracking COVID-19 impacts on the food industry and, and the retail sector. And this is data that they provided to um, Seafood Source in, in an interview. Um, so um, looking at uh, the three different departments uh, in typical grocery stores, you've got canned, frozen, and the, and the fresh aisle. And um, compared to um, um, February, looking at February 1 to March 31st of this year compared to past year, um, all sectors are, are up in terms of seafood sales. And canned and frozen are, are up um, over 50% in sales compared to last year. So you can really see the effects of consumers turning from restaurants to retail here in these sales. Um, they haven't updated their numbers yet for the summer. Um, so we'll, I'm very curious to see what's gonna happen there. There's also a lot more interest in buying local and direct marketed seafood. And these are two interactive maps that help Americans find local seafood. Um, one's put out by Local Catch and the other's put out by the um, University of Washington. Uh, which includes local catch data. Um, so I was able to catch up with Josh Stoll, who's a professor at University of Maine, and he works with local catch. Um, he reports that uh, user traffic on the local catch website in the US is up 300% from March to May 2020 as compared to previous years. So people are, are using his website a lot more to be able to connect to, um, to local seafood. So that's, that's really encouraging to hear. Uh, but I look forward to hearing more from Josh and, and more from uh, the Local Catch Project about how they're doing. Uh, but it is really interesting. Um, we know that about 70% of consumer expenditures are at restaurants. So um, during the pandemic, as you know, there's um, restaurant visits are way down, much below normal. Um, and this data comes from Open Table, which is a restaurant reservation app. And they release their data publicly um, and so uh, I believe it covers about 20,000 uh, restaurants in the U.S. So you can see, you know, initially uh, during the first few weeks of the pandemic in the U.S., restaurant visits dropped off sharply. And they've come back a little, you know, through the summer, but um, they're not back to where they were um, in 2019. So um, this is giving us a sense of what's going on at the, the retail and restaurant space um, some of it's related to seafood. And the last slide I'll show you about coronavirus and, and seafood actually comes from China. And it, this is sort of a lesson for the future. Um, so uh, other countries have already rebounded from the first wave of the pandemic. And um, the U.S. is clearly still in the first uh, wave. Um, so we can draw some lessons from other countries. Um, so what I'm presenting here are weekly sales data. Um, from 147 major wholesale markets in China. And this, this is data reported by the Chinese government. Um, and it's also um, in our preprint on COVID impacts. So you can check it out there. 
uh, if you want to see more details. But um, so what we've done in this figure is grouped seafood that's uh, typically sold at retail. And you can see in, those are um, seafood in red. Um, the carp is a freshwater farm um, product that's um, a little bit cheaper um, uh, price per pound. And that's typically sold at retail, at retail but th these are purchases made from the wholesale market. And then in blue are fish that are sold at the wholesale market, but typically go to restaurants. And uh, hair tails, which is a marine capture fishery species, and, um, and a, yellow, a large yellow croaker, which is a, a marine farm species. And they have a little bit higher market price. Um, so you can see um, when the pandemic hit China in, in January and February, um, you know, all sales of, of seafood dropped off sharply. Um, but what's really interesting is to look at the recovery. And in uh, late March, early April, retail sales or species that are sold at retail have climbed back up to uh, pre-pandemic uh, levels. But um, so far, uh, restaurant, the species sold to restaurant, uh, the restaurant sector have not returned. Um, and so this is, this is an interesting insight for, um, for us in the US. And as you recall from the previous slide, um, restaurants are a little bit slower to rebound while the retail sector is getting more, um, more demand. So that's the case in other countries as well. Uh, so uh, that's sort of just a quick recap of some of the data we have on COVID-19 and seafood at the retail and restaurant sector. And I'm sure more data is gonna come out in the coming weeks uh, and months as, as we study this issue. This is really funny to say, but this is uh, pre-COVID data. <laughs> I think a lot of things are, you can now mark as pre or post COVID. So this is uh, pre COVID data on consumers and their seafood consumption patterns. Um, and most of this data is come from, gonna come from the US. Um, so here we see a, a series of different um, research and policy reports that really guide our thinking about recommendations um, on seafood consumption. Um, and seafood is highlighted in these reports for a number of reasons. Um, one is that Seafood has uh, these unique nutritional properties, um, and that's their omega-3 fatty acid content that makes it healthy to eat. And um, eating seafood is really you know, associated with reductions in cardiovascular disease risks and neurocognitive outcomes um, in both children and adults. So um, that's one reason to promote seafood. And the other is that it can be harvested or farmed in ways that um, have smaller environmental impacts uh, than other types of meat. So those are, those are two key features here. Um, on the far left, you'll see the, um, it's the dietary guidelines, um, which is the main um, US policy document for seafood um, consumption guidance. Um, and they primarily focus on seafood as a healthy uh, food item. Um, you'll see in the middle is the Eat Lancet report. And this is the translation piece um, from Eat Lancet. Um, now they focus on uh, seafood as both healthy and sustainable. But we see this emerging trend that people are talking about uh, all kinds of food, uh, not just in terms of healthy and sustainable, but also, also adding affordable to the mix. And um, kind of as we move forward, thinking about how seafood fits in to people's diets from a nutritional standpoint, from a sustainability standpoint, and from an equity standpoint, is gonna be very important. So that's why I feature these, these three reports. There are other ways that we look at, at seafood consumption. Um, uh, the Fisheries of the United States has been a key resource for um, publishing about US seafood supply. And many journalists writing about seafood cover um, one key number that comes out each year, which in which uh, the Fisheries of the United States uh, takes the total seafood supply. They take the U.S. seafood supply in, in terms of the um, total um, raw uh, edible weight, and they divide it by the U.S. population. Uh, and that gives a per capita, uh, they call it per capita consumption. And it's uh, last year that was 16.1 pounds per year. And you'll see in these uh, news articles that I've put in in the slideshow, a lot of groups uh, pick up on that. Um, so in the following slides, I'm going to make the argument that there are better ways to track U.S. seafood consumption 
than, uh, than the Fisheries of the United States uh, method. One way of tracking uh, seafood consumption is by looking at uh, seafood intake um, using these classic public health methods and data sets, one of which is the National Health Nutrition Examination Survey. And uh, this is uh, produced by the CDC and USDA. Uh, it's released every two years. And part of it includes dietary intake data through a dietary recall um, study. It's a long running data set. Um, you can actually link it to demographic information, nutrient contents, expenditures, uh, and a subset of the population they take biospecimens. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff that you can get from uh, this uh, study. It's called, the acronym is called NHANES. What I, I've pulled together uh, four different papers that have looked at per capita um, adult uh, seafood intake. Um, I've broken it down by men and women, and in the far right column, you'll see the study period. Um, oftentimes, there's a delay in publishing these sorts of studies. Um, it takes a while to collect the data, to run the analyses, so um, oftentimes it, they're a few years behind the actual date. But what you can see here uh, is that um, we've got weekly per capita intake as ounces per week, um, and then I've multiplied that through to get the annual per capita intake. And I took the average of these four studies, and you'll see the average pounds per year eaten is uh, 15 pounds for men and 10.6 pounds uh, for women. And then when you factor in uh, youth, you know, people un under the age of uh, what, you know, 18 or 21, uh, which, in, which is about a quarter of the U.S. population, the per capita seafood consumption by NHANES is about 12 pounds per year. So I just wanted to highlight that, uh, that's a big difference between the seafood supply estimate, which is 16 pounds per capita, and what NHANES report, what we can find from NHANES, which is actual seafood consumption reported through dietary recall studies, uh, would be about 12 pounds per year um, per capita for the United States. So I think that NHANES gives us a really powerful tool for looking at seafood consumption. So this is a question that a lot of people want to know is what proportion of the U.S. population eats seafood? Um, Lisa Johns, who's a USDA researcher, and her colleagues have done a really excellent job of, of looking at this question and um, again using NHANES data. And they found that 80% uh, of uh, US adults eat seafood on a monthly basis. That means they've eaten it at least once per month. And then about 74% um, of, of adults eat, eat fish, and 50% of adults eat seafood. Um, well, actually, I um, and then they, they break it out by age and they find that older Americans eat more seafood. Um, and if you saw a recent um, Food Marketing Institute report called The Power of Seafood, they did a separate survey that found that 32% of, of Americans eat seafood at least once a month. And that is really different than, than Lisa's finding of, of 80%. Um, and uh, well, NHANES is a nationally representative sample um, the, the FMI study might be a smaller sample. So you need to look into why those two, those two values are different. And um, it really points to how NHANES can help inform um, our thinking about seafood consumption. Now, John's et al. has also broken out seafood intake by different um, socioeconomic and education groups. And that, um, as we've seen elsewhere, higher income levels and higher education, which corresponds to income, um, also eat more seafood. Um, and that holds true for seafood, fish, and all shellfish, uh, shellfish being uh, crustaceans and mollusks. This is the last table for a little while, but uh, I'll, I just want to, this is a really important table because it looks at the gap between uh, the actual amount that's eaten and what's recommended um, uh, from U.S. dietary guidelines. And so as you're pr probably aware, the U.S. Di dietary guidelines recommend eight ounces per week but that's a general recommendation. So if you're more active than that, or if, um, if you um, are older or younger, you might have a different uh, caloric needs. So this study by Johns et al. breaks out the caloric need uh, for different age groups, whether they're sedentary or active, and then looks at the percent of, uh, uh, the, percent of the population that uh, is below the recommended amount seafood. Um, and so you see this first column on the left is the mean intake by age group. And then you'll see 
on the, the next two columns to the right of that are the per percent uh, below, which means the percent, that, the percent of Americans that are uh, not meeting the seafood intake recommendations, which is really quite high. It's about 80 to 90% of Americans aren't meeting the recommended seafood intake levels. They are actually, instead of being at eight ounces or 10 ounces or nine ounces, they're more at like between you know, four to six ounces a week. Not only are they not meeting the seafood intake recommendations, but Americans also aren't meeting the recommended intakes of omega-3 fatty acids. And um, this is really a key component of why people should be eating seafood. Uh, so it's not surprising that the two um, are related. Uh, this study is by um, Chesney Richter at University of Arizona, and it also includes this NHANES data set. So um, the Dietary Guidelines Committee recently released a report, uh, their scientific report ahead of the 2020 uh, Dietary Guidelines. And here's what they say about the current state of the science on omega-3s. Um, so they say that there's moderate evidence uh, indicating that total intake of omega-3s, and that's particularly EPA, DHA, uh, is linked with lower risk of cardiovascular disease. So this tells me that the dietary guidelines for seafood in the coming you know, 2020 to 2025 cycle are going to keep an emphasis on seafood. And here's some evidence that supports that, uh, that, that thinking that, that omega-3s and seafood are really important. So um, again, from this Richter et al. Uh, study, if you look at Americans with very high omega-3 fatty acid intakes, and you look at where they get that, that seafood from, um, mo that mostly comes from fish. So, um, and then if you look at the converse, Americans with very low um, omega-3 intake, they are hardly eating any fish at all. So uh, this, this is a really good point that that fish is what's driving high omega-3 levels in, in Americans uh, who, who have high omega-3 levels. Well, that's, <laughs> that's kind of a funny way to say it, but just that, that uh, omega-3 and fish are tightly linked and, and important. I just wanna pause and say that a lot of these, uh, a lot of the research by nutritionists sort of end at that previous statement where fish is a, a healthy source of omega-3s it's got all these benefits for, cart, uh, for diseases, et cetera. But um, this is a new study that our team has put out, which kind of looks, takes more of a food systems perspective. And um, we go beyond just thinking about why fish matters, but also look at the food environment and spending on seafood. And um, here, again, we've used the NHANES data set and uh, using the same uh, terminology that we heard earlier from USDA about food at home, which is mainly, you can think about it as grocery store food and food away from home, which is food uh, from, uh, from food service. And so we tried to build from the bottom up um, an estimate of food expenditure um, using um, this, uh, this NHANES data set. And we found very close to what uh, NIMPS found, which is about 70% of, of consumer expenditures on seafood are for food away from home, which is like restaurant seafood. Um, so, uh, but that's not the whole picture. And a lot of times what gets reported by the media is uh, this 70% of expenditures are from seafood and it gets conflated with 70% of seafood is eaten at restaurants. One of the things that our study can, can do is sort of debunk that myth. And so we were able to look at seafood consumption on a per weight basis in addition to a per dollar basis. And if you actually look at it on a per weight basis, um, looking at either the home versus away from home, uh, it's 61% to 39%. And if you break it out by a food source, you see that um, retail or grocery stores is far more important than any other category in terms of where Americans get the bulk of their seafood by, by weight. Uh, so this is starting to think about food source. And so this is for all seafood. And in the next slide, we're going to look at different species. Here are the, the top 10 species that were sold uh, uh, nationally, or the top, actually it's the top 10 by supply. But you can see a breakout of where they're sold, whether it's by at a grocery store, restaurant, uh, self-caught, uh, et cetera.
And you, see, you can see that Americans source different species uh, from stores and, and primarily things like salmon, tuna, and tilapia um, are eaten or purchased more at grocery stores, while species like shrimp and crab are more um, consumed at restaurants. So um, this is starting to kind of unpack this idea about why food source matters. And, and actually there's some, and there are differences in terms of species. Um, the next slide uh, asks a little bit different question, which is where, where are the top species um, consumed? And the question um, here is, was it eaten at home or not at home? So eaten at home would be things like uh, seafood that you prepare uh, yourself or, or even restaurant takeout that you eat at home. So that, those two things would be considered like eat, the seafood eaten at home. And you can see there's um, a similar trend like salmon, canned tuna, tilapia, which are more often purchased at retail are also more often eaten at home. Um, but, uh, you know, I think this is interesting because uh, it also plays into expenditure. So if you're eating out, you're going to be spending more and maybe serving size or portion size will be a little bit different. There are also, um, in the next slide, we'll look at uh, where, uh, where can, which uh, types of meals consumers eat seafood in. And again, this is from uh, this NHANES study. Um, so we'll see, we've broken out um, all meals and then breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snack. And you can see the majority of Americans, 62% of, of all seafood eaten is eaten at dinner. And we've broken it out by serving size. Um, and just to um, a footnote of that is that the recommended serving size is three ounces of, of cooked seafood. And um, if uh, Americans are eating a, a seafood dinner, they typically eat more than a recommended portion size. Um, lunches are right at the recommended portion size. Um, and then uh, seafood meals that are dinner are, are more often eaten at home, while lunch, seafood lunches are, all, are more often eaten away from home. Um, so this is just really fascinating, and um, I'm not sure what the implication is for the, uh, the seafood sector, but uh, just understanding a little bit more about the average American consumer and where they where they go for seafood at different times of the day is, is interesting. The title of this slide is Why Eating at Home Matters. And uh, from a, I'm coming at this from a public health uh, perspective. And this is a study by Julia Wolfson and, and Sarah Blake, who are colleagues of mine at, at Johns Hopkins. And they looked at, um, at folks who cooked at home frequently versus those that didn't. Uh, again, with this uh, NHANES data set, and they found that for people who cook at home more often, they'll have uh, lower um, they'll have lower kilojoules, uh, fat, and sugar intake than people who didn't cook at home very often. So, we really want to encourage a healthy habit of eating at home because it's it's you you end up eating more healthfully, and um, seafood happens to be one of the food items that people, um, although there are a lot of it, a higher share of expenditures at, away from home. Uh, eating at home is a really popular thing to do for seafood. And it's by far where most Americans get their uh, intake from seafood is, is at home. I'm gonna next shift to another block of slides on the retail sector. Uh, this area, um, there's so many ways to, to unpack the retail sector. And um, I'm really just gonna look at one set of data that talks about the retail sector. I know there are many other ways to get at it. Um, but I'm looking at uh, retail uh, studies that have used retail scanner data. And um, they include both you know, sort of classic public health approaches to um, like looking at the sodium content of packaged foods or looking at um, whether a, a soda tax is working uh, in terms of consumption habits, um, as well as some, some research by the aquaculture in, um, uh, and the aquaculture economists looking at um, marketing trends and, and seafood sales at retail. This is just to remind everybody that what retail means is a lot of different things. Um, and I've got a list of the top uh, grocery stores. And I just wanna point out that among this list are several chain stores, uh, Walmart, Costco, Sam's Club, 
and they really have a big impact on um, market share and a lot of um, a lot of consumers buy seafood from from these stores so when we think about retail we also need to think about uh, club stores this is um, and I, I couldn't find a whole lot of studies on um, on the, the retail sector uh, but I did look at um, a study uh, by Day et al. Uh, that came out recently, looking at um, fish purchases. And I, I pulled out this table because I think it, it's pretty interesting. Um, it points to uh, that seafood purchases increase with household income. Um, although there's some species that are popular in, in all different income levels. And um, this, this is a really interesting study to read. And I encourage you to, to go check out the rest of the whole study. Um, and by the way, this just comes from frozen and frozen unbreaded seafood products because um, at the time that they published this, there wasn't good data on fresh sales uh, out of Nielsen. But um, in terms of an equity lens, it's important to think about uh, how accessible seafood is for, um, for low income and, and, and folks below the poverty line. This is another slide that, that looks at, um, uh, this is by uh, Singh et al, which includes Day as a co-author, um, and um, looking at the unit price of seafood um, sold at, at retail. And uh, one thing I noticed was just a really wide range of, of price per pound, and everything from $2 a pound to $6 a pound. And, um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm curious about is how does price affect access to seafood? Um, and particularly, uh, if species with lower uh, unit prices, do they have the same nutritional benefits in terms of omega-3 levels? And um, just to be careful about not making too strong recommendations about uh, certain seafood species, uh, particularly ones uh, that are higher, uh, have a higher unit price, um, because it, they may not be accessible to all Americans. Just to point out that there is regional variation in seafood purchasing. Um, so, um, and when we try to target strategies or interventions to promote seafood consumption, we also have to think about consumer preference and, and not, um, uh, and, you know, one type of fish isn't preferred in, in all, um, you know, markets. There's a lot of variation in what people prefer. And, and this is retail and there's also a whole mix, including recreational fishing that, that appears to matter. And then. The Anhanes data, um, about 5% of seafood that's eaten was self-caught or caught by someone that you know. Um, it seemed rather high, but I think it's an interesting point to add that a lot of our data sets um, don't do a good job of capturing uh, recreational fishing. Um, and uh, the last slide uh, is uh, just an interesting one to throw in there to kind of look at regional consumption. Uh, not from the sense of different species, but just uh, where are places that, that people eat more seafood or, or less seafood. Uh, so in our study, we, um, we try to look at this. Uh, the inset map is the per capita consumption by region. And as I mentioned, like the Midwest, um, the South have lower consumption levels. Uh, there's more consumption on the coastline. And if you account for that and multiply through by uh, the population, you can get a map like this that we produced, which shows you on a per, uh, let's say this is tons per, um, per county, uh, what the population, what, what the consumption level is. And um, it's not a per capita number, it's a total number. So it's, it gives you some idea about where the seafood supply is moving in the country uh, to what, what parts of the country mainly uh, coastlines where there's uh, more population and, and cities. So the last uh, set of slides, uh, I'm going to talk about the restaurant sector and uh, I'm going to feature a study that, that we did. Um, it's actually still in, in peer review. Um, to kind of kick off this topic, um, I'm sharing uh, some trends that the National Restaurant Association um, uh, provided in a in a 2018 survey of chefs, and um, in green are are um, are these issues that relate to local or sustainable seafood, and other kind of sustainability concerns. Um, 
So um, with this, um, you can see that local and sustainable is, is a prominent feature in what, in what restaurants are interested in. So with that, we developed uh, some research questions around that. We wanted to know, well, first of all, you know, what seafood is sold at, at restaurants? Because I don't think you really have a good sense. Um, unless you know, you know your local wholesaler, you can ask them. But nationally, we don't have a really good sense. Um, how is seafood labeled at restaurants was another question. And then lastly, we wanted to know, um, is seafood at sold at restaurants prepared in, in a nutritional way? Um, okay, so hopefully this paper will be out in the fall. Um, but I'll, I'll show you some, some tables and figures from the, from the study now. This data set that we used was actually one that we generated ourselves. And it comes from this recent ruling. The, the FDA has mandated that restaurant chains with over 20 locations and, um, need to now post uh, nutrition information um, on their physically on the menu, but they also need to provide some details online, uh, things like the total calories, calories from fat, some more of the details about you know, carbohydrates, fiber, sugar, protein. And they end up posting these things online in a PDF generally. So um, our team uh, scraped uh, internet websites for the, nutri the nutritional content of seafood sold at, at chain restaurants nationally. This is the first table of our paper. And we started with 250 chain restaurants in the US. Um, we narrowed that down to 159 that sold seafood. Um, we knew that because on their menu, they had seafood listed on the menu. Um, so we broke the, the restaurants down into four different groups. Um, and you can see the table on the left side. Uh, QSR is the industry speak for fast food. Um, and you can see the far right column examples of different um, restaurants in that mold. Uh, fast casual is um, somewhere in between fast food and casual dining. Uh, and then fine dining chain restaurants would be like a white tablecloth restaurant. There are not very many of them in our data set. But um, the interesting thing is that um, as you move to more expensive restaurant types, um, the proportion of those chains selling seafood goes up. And um, overall, about 64% of um, restaurants, chain restaurant brands, uh, do have seafood on their menu, which actually, if you crunch the numbers, that plays out to be over 110,000 individual branch stores across the US that sell seafood. So that's reaching a lot of consumers. If you look at their menus, you could uh, sort of see where seafood is on the menu. And those would be those, the donuts on the left hand side of the screen. Um, and you can see that, for example, uh, QSR, which is fast food, you know, there's a mix of, of seafood as menu, as an entree, a small dish, uh, an appetizer. Um, when you get down to casual dining, it's mostly entree. Uh, for fine dining, actually, most of the um, seafood items were, were appetizers. Um, and then we looked at how many species were on the menu. And again, as you uh, get more higher price chains, uh, they're, they're going to be serving more, more different, a different number of species on the menu. So more diverse, they have a more diverse um, uh, needs in terms of what they purchase. There, okay, so there's a lot on, on this slide, <laughs> but let me just um, kind of orient you to how to read this. Um, so um, this figure looks at species that are listed on chain restaurant menus. So if you look um, horizontally, you can see which species are sold at different chains. So you can first just start with like, for example, QSR or fast food. And um, the intensity of the color indicates how frequently certain species appear on the menu. Um, and this all sums to 100%. Um, and if you looked uh, vertically, you can see uh, species, how often they're, they're on different types of menus, whether it's fine dining, casual dining, fast casual, or QSR. And you can see this dark blue uh, vertical bar, that's uh, shrimp, which is the most popular item on seafood menus at, at, at chain restaurants. Um, also, um, tuna and salmon feature prominently. Um, you can see um, the casual dining 
uh, running horizontally. They have a lot of different species on their menu. Uh, um, and that's really exciting to see that they're, that they're reaching to try to get so many different species and regionally and, um, and seasonally. So um, we also were able to link the menu data set to store geolocation, uh, to map the availability of species. And um, each of the, the, the blocks, the, the unit size on this map is the core based statistical area. Um, and that's a little bit bigger than a zip code, but smaller than a county. Uh, you can think about like a metro area would be a CBSA. Um, so this map shows that stores um, on a per capita basis, uh, so we divide it through by the population, uh, but it's mostly driven by the number of chain stores in an area. Um, but what you can see if you look at this, uh, like let's, let's look at the top left, Pollock, um, the areas in darker blue are going to have um, more restaurants per capita that sell Pollock um, in, that, in that CBSA. And you can look at just general trends. Um, Pollock is on more restaurant menus than tilapia. And so it has generally, the US is a bit darker for Pollock than for tilapia. Um, we have a bunch of maps for a bunch of different species. Um, not in this particular graphic, but in the paper, you can see that uh, catfish has a regional appeal in the south, which you'd expect. Um, we also found um, some regional uh, species um, focused in on Ohio, which is really interesting. Um, we saw, um, this is just a really neat way to plot the data. Um, but um, so um, one thing that really surprised us was that the Midwest has really good coverage for seafood sales. Um, oh, I should point out areas that are in gray are areas where we just don't have restaurant data uh, because it wasn't in our data set. Um, not because there aren't restaurants there, but just wasn't in, in our data set. Um, but the Midwest has pretty good uh, coverage for seafood. However, uh, paradoxically, they have very low uh, per capita seafood consumption. So there, there is seafood out there, but um, it's not making it into the diet the same way. So this is answering that last question of the study. Um, is seafood, are seafood menu items nutritious? Uh, so um, just to orient you to this figure. Um, so on the, on the y-axis are the grams of saturated fat in a typical uh, seafood menu item. And the x-axis are different, um, different types of, of dishes, you know, whether it's entree, a sandwich, a soup, a taco, et cetera. And then the, the blue dashed line that runs horizontally, that is the recommended daily intake of saturated fat uh, for men. And in, in green is the recommended amount for women. So I'll just say that again, that's the recommended daily intake. Um, the way to look at this, um, these are called violin plots and they're really similar to like a box and whisker. So the, it's going to show you the um, interquartile range, and then in red is the, the average. I think it's the median. So um, for the, the, now what's interesting about this is that a lot of seafood dishes served at restaurants have higher caloric, uh, you would, you'd be eating, if you ate the whole thing, you would eat your, your recommended daily amount of saturated fat. Next slide looks at um, sodium. Uh, simil similar situation, um, so that blue bar is the recommended daily intake of sodium. So some of these uh, meals at, um, at fast food chains and, and other chain restaurants um, are a little bit high in, in sodium and saturated fat. And so um, guiding consumers uh, to, to eat seafood, which is generally thought of as a healthy, um, a healthy meal, it can be prepared, you know, if it's breaded, or fried, it can be prepared in such a way so that it's no longer uh, that all that healthy. And actually, when you look at uh, health outcomes, um, uh, and they've done this, um, you know, you can you can see that eating fried fish, um, you don't get those omega three heart benefits that you would if you if you ate like a baked fish. So this is just something to keep in mind. Um, and, and really to encourage restaurants to try to reformulate their seafood menu items so that they, they are as healthy as, as the products are when they come in the door.
So this last slide I want to show you is to answer this question about um, sustainability. And um, that, that's a big question and probably too much to tackle from just this study. But we wanted to look at when, the, when seafood was on chain restaurant menus, were they labeled in terms of production methods? And that's the top part of this table or geographic origin. And so um, specifically for production method, we want to know, was it listed as being wild caught, farmed, or, or no description? And um, you can see the top, we list the top species in each of those categories. Uh, so the top farm species that were mentioned were catfish and fish. The top wild caught species were wahoo, salmon, pollock, flounder, etc. And we also looked at origin, whether it was listed, the country of origin was listed. Um, and um, just some, a quick uh, summary finding from this was that 82% uh, of restaurants and 96% of menu items did not report production methods. So they didn't say whether it was farmed or wild caught. And also um, looking at origin, 66% of restaurants and 94% of menu items didn't report um, origin. So as you can see here, the chain restaurant industry has a ways to go in terms of uh, consumer facing information about seafood. Um, however, just to caveat that and say that um, I understand that seafood buyers uh, in, like having the flexibility of switching between uh, products from different countries uh, based on price, um, seasonality, availability, and that supplying an entire chain from one source uh, is really maybe not practical. So um, posting current and accurate menus with origin and production information uh, could be pretty hard, um, you know, particularly for, for shrimp, which comes from so many different countries. Um, so that, that's a challenge. And to do it from a, for an entire chain is very difficult. Uh, but this study just points to the fact that chain restaurants currently uh, are not doing a great job with, um, with labeling production method or origin for their seafood. That was, that was a study that's hopefully going to be coming out soon, and I can share that with you guys in the future. Just some summary and concluding thoughts, uh, some things to, to leave you all with. Um, well, we started the talk uh, talking about COVID-19 and how it's um, disproportionately affecting the food service industry, um, well, negatively affecting. And so sort of a, uh, something to think about is whether these shifts that we are seeing um, towards retail uh, which are short term, whether they'll actually become long term changes or habits for uh, for shoppers. And I don't think that's something we know right now, but it's something to, to look for. Um, and we'll keep an eye on that. Um, another uh, big point from this uh, presentation is that uh, the NHANES uh, data set, and particularly the, the 24 hour dietary recall studies that are part of NHANES, um, they're uh, not just good at informing us about nutritional needs, but also can be used to understand seafood sourcing and expenditures and really can complement existing data on, on seafood supply. Um, we also saw from putting together these slides that, uh, that I noticed that there's a really big gap in the retail and restaurant food environment in terms of uh, published literature. And a lot of that information is housed within companies uh, and, and not really making it out there to at least the academic audience or, or other folks. Uh, so um, more of these studies that I showed you are gonna really lend light to these kind of issues about uh, food access and, and availability and sales. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to point to is that um, as we've seen the, the, that people are buying more seafood and cooking at home these days, and that uh, it would be great to promote seafood at home cooking um, because it, there are so many nutritional benefits from cooking at home. And um, seafood is something that we want to get people out of their, you know, people who are not comfortable cooking seafood at home, get them feeling better about that so they can, you know, start taking advantage of, of all the great seafood that's, that's here in the U.S. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll close and just say thank you so much um, to the hosts for inviting me and I'll be happy to take any questions.